Um, Jason's actually been working with um, artificial intelligence products in the space field. It's probably uh, a simple word for it. Uh, and both basically trying to make space flight easier for, for various companies. And um, basically, Jason has now um, last year signed a contract with um, Axiom Space, which is um, going to be setting up a private space station. So Jason's going to tell us a bit more about this activity and also um, give us an overview of um, how he's come to a particularly really interesting project for Australia. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. And hello, everybody. Uh, this presentation is pretty informal. I know we've got some slick slides, but it's really just kind of a chance to uh, engage and, and let you know what we're doing. So if you have any questions, go, go ahead and jump in the middle of it. We don't have to, we can keep this whole thing family style. Um, but the, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about Sabre first and, and you know, myself and what we do. Uh, and it'll kind of make sense why Sabre Astronautics is going down this route. But um, obviously we, we all are in the space industry because we, we want an astronaut, you know, we want to be astronauts and we want to fly in space. We want to you know, build the next generation of a space program. Um, so this project kind of ties into that own kind of, kind of personal motivation to do it. But um, Sabre Astronautics uh, has been around since 2008. Uh, I founded it right after my PhD. Um, and as Wayne Sh Short said, I, I did my PhD in machine learning and applied it to space. But what, what's eventually evolved over the course of, I guess, uh, 15 years of business is Sabre Astronautics is a space operations company. So we sell satellite uh, operations as a service for companies who want to fly. We provide a full stack mission control service. So we've got connections to ground stations and, and we have operation centers in two continents. Uh, we're very heavily invested in space traffic management and space domain awareness. Uh, if you're not aware of those terms, I'm happy to kind of unpack that for you as well. Um, but just a, a, a bit of a history for you. I, I mean, our background uh, we founded in, in 2008. We're, we're kind of an avant-garde space company. Um, you know, heritage, you know, our people worked on uh, the ISS and Hubble, so we, we kind of understand that environment uh, mixed with academic rigor. Uh, we do have an internship program that, that attracts about 150 people uh, per year, and, and so we get very strong uh, young graduates who come in and we train them up. And, we send them out into the world for the ones that we can't hire. Uh, company is about 50 people in it. So we're still a small business, but we're very stable as a small business and, and well-established uh, in, in the Australian ecosystem in the US as well. Um, and uh, yeah, the mission control center that we built out, uh, the whole history about it is we start off with machine learning. We solved the diagnostics problem for space. So when a spacecraft gets under threat or, or is damaged from space weather or something like this, uh, our software's proven ability to diagnose what the problem is and do full root cause analysis. And what we did was we said we needed a way to visualize that better. So we made a, a product uh, called the Predictive Ground Station Interface, affectionately called Piggy on top of that. That's a uh, video game tools used for mission ops. Uh, and uh, it built a whole spacecraft design capability around that, which we sold to uh, help companies in Australia uh, build their own businesses. And uh, you know, more recently, uh, we won the uh, we we put this into a program for live operations as a service. We call it the Responsive Space Operations Center. Uh, you get full stack operations, follow the sun operations. So when you have a satellite that launches, that's owned by an Australian company, then we can support them from our Colorado Mission Control Center. And uh, when an American company flies, we support them out of Australia. Uh, some of you might not be aware, but we won the Mission Control Center grant from the Australian Space Agency. So this right here is a Mission Control Center we set up in, in Adelaide at the Space Agency's headquarters. Uh, and uh, this picture below is, is one of the tools we do in the virtual reality operations um, to the U.S. Space Force. We actually sell our products into the U.S. ecosystem, which is a bit backwards. Usually the Americans come in here and sell to you, but we actually make it here and sell it back to the Americans. Uh, so that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, so, you know, we're, we're selling a mission control service. Uh, it's a global operational capability. Uh, we got a full manifest of, of customers. And that's a picture of our US mission control center. It's a bit smaller than the Australian one. Uh, so they have to put flags, American flags up there just to, just to show a bit of American pride. Well, you know, we don't, we don't have to show the Australian flag up here. We all know where that's sitting. 
Uh, and that's that's uh, Scott Morrison. Uh, love him or not, but he did manage to come in and say hello to to us and and do a view of the of the site. And and that's Bureau of Metrology with the space weather uh, screen up up there providing service. We're actually a data ingest from them, you know, which is pretty exciting as well. Uh, so that kind of brings us to the, the the reason why we're doing all this mission operations support is. You know, this this motivation of the democratization of space, which means anyone from anywhere in the world could be a part of this industry that we love. Now, NSSA is an enthusiast group. Uh, I don't come here because I expect anybody in this room to give us money. Uh, I come here because I want to engage and because before I started Sabre Astronautics, I was one of you. I was uh, a member of the NSSA and the Mars Society and and uh, I was a space enthusiast and I simply converted my passion into space to building a business. That's something that anybody can do uh, and I feel should do if you wanna be a part of this. So we took this mission control center and said, so how do we make this available? So anyone, whether, and, and we support student groups and universities, and that's actually one of our very happy customers with one of our products is the Orbit Tether, uh, all the way up to, um, you know, the, the CubeSat and kind of industry CubeSats that you're seeing these days and in larger spacecraft uh, like the, the uh, Terra Bella spacecraft that was uh, one of the Google spacecraft. Uh, we're helping organizations get from brand new, hey, no kidding, I wanna play, how do I actually do it? To getting up in the sky and we're a part of that story. Uh, and we started a space incubator in Sydney called the Wolfpack Space Hub. So anybody who's got an idea or has uh, a, a specific motivation of a business they wanna grow in the space sector, um, we help them fly and find money for it. And the companies that we have brought to our incubator generated 3 million last year because of the program we put together. So if you tie that together, you, know, you get the operation side, you know, democratization, helping people get into space. And, and my thought was, you know, the, the, the Australian space industry, uh, we've got a space agency now, we've got companies that are growing into this, but we don't have any Australian space astronauts. It's always been one of those things that we talked about uh, in these circles saying, wouldn't it be awesome if we had a chance to fly? And I was watching Axiom, uh, the, 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 this is the first flight crew that, that uh, they're, they're sending up. I, I, I don't memorize their names, unfortunately. I don't have all the playing cards for astronauts. Uh, I, I got a few friends who are who are former astronauts. Uh, some of them you might have met in the past. Uh, but um, as an enthusiast, I'm more enthusiastic about the mission than it is than, than I am about uh, the individual. And, and I can tell you, if you, you've got a former astronaut right here's the mission commander, and three venture capitalists. Uh, so so these trips to Axiom are space tourism in the first go. Uh, I could tell you that the process for astronaut selection is not just money, it's money plus uh, uh, motivation and character. You know, the, 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 uh, the, the Axiom astronaut uh, wants to make sure that he's flying in space with people that are trustworthy, that can handle uh, the, the actual program. Um, and uh, when you're flying in space as a tourist for a short period of time, uh, it is a bit different from flying in longer periods of time where we really do have to trust the person next to you. So uh, what I said to them was, all right, um, I'm going to skip ahead here because I'm trying to, yeah, here we go. Yeah, that, that's, that's probably good. I said, okay, it's, it's one thing to, to uh, we, we set up a deal with them so that we can find uh, uh, wealthy people from Australia that could go. And I, I thought about it, I was like, you know, we could do this. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Uh, it's their money if, if that's how they want to spend it. But democratization of space, how do we set up a program where the goal is to build Australian industry? Because the ISS is a platform for R&D that Australians don't really have a lot of access to. Because if you think about it, as a nation, we are not a signatory to the space station. We did not contribute money to building that space station. So you know, we don't really have a direct right. Uh, we have to... Uh, purchase a way to get on board. Um, but what if we were to find an industry use case uh, for that space station where that ticket, uh, tens of millions of dollars, by the way, for, for a ticket, uh, can build industry products which can generate revenue. 
uh, getting industry involved means that uh, you've got a group of companies buying a ticket. And then Sabre will manage the uh, astronaut selection process and have a national call. Uh, and because it's Sabre doing the actual astronaut uh, application, then uh, that national call will allow anybody who can perform the task of an astronaut to apply, okay? So you've completely democratized that process and you're building Australian commercial tech through the benefits of the microgravity environment. And the astronaut can be an Australian citizen, does not have to get a US citizenship, right? So, so that's really kind of that motivational goal behind the, the program. So let's talk on the industry side for a little bit and say, all right, can, what, what does it really take? Why is there an industry interest in this? And we did a bunch of research when we first started talking to Axiom about the program. And uh, we've unpacked a couple of things that are fairly public in, uh, in, in the internet. Any one of you can do your own research and say, what is, uh, uh, you know, what is R&D? What R&D is happening on the ISS? And then the backstory is which of these are this R and D projects can turn into companies that make money, um, and the first one off first cap off the rank is pharmaceutical industry. Uh, pharma, pharmaceutical industry is spend, spending millions of dollars in space already, and uh, they start off with small projects, but they're actually expanding into actual programs and products. And what's interesting is that they are not filing patents; they're not telling anybody what they're making. It's all under secret squirrel, but they are growing the amount of money they're spending every single year, okay? Um, the next one is 3D printed organs. Uh, and the reason why 3D printing, it sounds a bit macabre, but it, it's interesting because if you've got you know, gravity pushing down, it's actually difficult to make the structures for 3D printed organs. And uh, these are fairly expensive products to begin with. So it kind of makes sense that the cost of making it in space might be able to close the loop there. Um, then low cost, high reliability satellite manufacture. That's an area that Sabre has an interest in because uh, the whole idea right now is uh, you, you've got this you know, revolution of small satellites that have happened uh, in the last 10 years. And it's reduced the cost of your entry level satellite from a couple of hundred million dollars down to about $250,000. And uh, $250,000 is really bootstrappable. You know, you can do friends and family round. You could go to you know, angel investors. If you have a good business plan, you could raise that without too much effort. Um, but if you're 3D printing that satellite, if you're doing on-orbit manufacture for the satellite, uh, you're bringing that cost down to almost $30,000. That's essentially the cost of buying an automobile. So you think about it. Those of you in this room who have kids or grandkids, uh, you know, by the time that kid reaches 18 years old, instead of buying them a car, you could buy them a, a printed satellite or, on orbit and they can start making their product, right? Fiber optics as, as well, you know, the, the conditions in zero gravity means you, you, you get uh, near perfect crystallization. Uh, it, yeast, you know, loves zero gravity and, and, and microbes love zero gravity as well. So anything where you're manufacturing fiber optics and, and crystals, you know, quantum computing is another area that's growing. It's very early days for quantum computing, um, but it's definitely of interest in, in on-orbit uh, uh, manufacture of, of computing. But uh, research in silicon chip manufacturing um, has resulted in a thousand time performance improvement. If you make the silicon chip in space, then you're getting a thousand time improvement in terms of speed and reliability of the chip as opposed to doing it on Earth which should interest everybody because everyone knows that there's a silicon chip uh, uh, shortage in the world today. So that's, a, that's another area of interest. Uh, and, and another one is large space structures. I'm not gonna talk too much about today, but uh, these are the, the, the industry areas I think can be made. And, and so the first port of call of the program is to find out which of these products should be made uh, on orbit by Australians. So uh, that, that's the start of it. So, that, that starts our, our, our program, uh, which we're, we've signed the agreement last year. The program set up is that first phase, which is happening this year. 
Uh, and the goal is really to engage industry and take all those different product areas that, that you found and close the loop in financial programs, okay? So the idea is the, the industry partners bring forth products that they wanna make on orbit, right? The astronaut's job is to fly their products and do the manufacturing for them, okay? So that first phase, we're not gonna worry about the astronaut quite yet. Let's worry about the, the industry projects and it's gotta be a coalition of the willing. Uh, so Sabre's program is gonna completely open and open to any industry that feels like they have a commercial advantage by manufacturing in space, as opposed to manufacturing on Earth. All right, so the first step in this process, which we've started, is to engage all the state governments and talking to them and getting them to get in touch with their own industries. Because Sabre Astronautics as a space company, we got really good understanding and intel on the other space companies that are in Australia. Uh, but the state governments are really going to understand which um, projects and in, in which uh, companies are within their own realm of interests, right? So yeah, that includes industry and academic researchers, and we're going to get them together in the workshops. And the goal of the workshops are to identify the projects and tie up the industry leaders with academics within their, their area so they can inform them on the process. Uh, and, and we're going to use these workshops also to inform the public on how the applications for the projects are gonna go and how to close the loop. Okay, so once the projects are formed, uh, the industry members that form the projects uh, engage in seed funding programs. Now, some of these companies are gonna have money already, all right, that they're gonna put on the table. Uh, some of those companies might be a bit younger and want to find projects from other areas. So we've identified different funding mechanisms uh, that the government has already put on the table uh, and that includes CRCPs, that includes uh, Australian Space Agency funding, uh, you know, that's for like discovery projects, uh, and that also includes state level fundings in every state. So New South Wales has got a couple of interesting ones. Uh, the um, uh, New South Wales Space Research Network might be one. You got a lot of kind of uh, co-funding mechanisms that exist that allow you to kind of grow from uh, smaller um, uh, projects to larger projects. And that, that's really the kind of thing, if you've got a smaller company and you want to fund a project to the ISS, you know you got to spend anywhere from 1 million to 5 million per project, okay? Per product, that is the amount of money you got to spend. Um, but the good news is if you get a benefit from making that product in space, uh, then that's investable further down the line and, and that gives you a competitive advantage. So that's the loop we're trying to close. Okay. Um, and so that tells us, okay, based on the amount of money, we're expecting one to five million each, 12 to 25 projects. And we have the ticket for 30 to 60 days on orbit. Okay. Now, 60 days on orbit is as long as you want to go without going to that next level of uh, medical risk and medical safety. So if we go for a 60 day ticket, you know, we're, we're spending tens of millions of dollars. It's just long enough, it's that kind of sweet spot where for most of the flight tickets, so most of the industry projects and, and manufacturing experiments, we, we wanna be able to do, if you think about it, 60 days and 25 projects, it's a lot of work for an astronaut on orbit. It's probably gonna take them the whole 60 days to support all those 25 different products. Okay, and you could do that without having to, to do uh, a NASA astronaut level um, uh, investigation on human health. Uh, you, you can still do that within the framework of an of a Axiom uh, flight. Okay, so, so those workshops obviously are going to start in the first quarter. Uh, the engagements that, that phase one is starting already. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at. All right, so phase two is the pre flight stage. Uh, the goal of phase two is to do product uh, development, production development, and to secure funding for that seed. Okay, so you remember phase one is about discovery and finding who's, it, who's who in the zoo. Uh, the beginning of phase four has got to be commitments from the industry parties. Okay, so the commitment uh, for several of those companies will allow us to do a down payment and secure that seed. The moment that seed's secured, we're in, 
Okay, the moment that seat's secured, then we can start uh, working and getting those products and doing development, production by team, all right? So each industry partner is responsible for their own product development because it's their product, it's their IP. We don't own any of that. But what we can do is we can help them with other assets that we have on the table. And I got two weird acronyms down here. I'll explain what they mean. NSQN stands for the National Space Qualification Network. Uh, that's ANU's uh, 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 program that they won funding for from the Australian Space Agency that allows them to test a product and get it right, okay? So uh, any industry product that needs testing, we could connect them directly to the NSQN because uh, Saver's a subcontractor. We're providing the data framework uh, that they use to connect uh, their products to. Uh, and that's what also is also stands for open source space operations. Uh, it's going to be available pretty much to anybody who wants to do the back end software coding for whatever products they make. Uh, that's a Sabre Astronautics product uh, that we built out under another Australian Space Agency ISI grant. All right. So you, you can imagine that year people are doing development and they got money on the table and they really want to make it work. Uh, at the end of that year, we're going to be doing astronaut selection process. Uh, national call. Uh, we might do some pre-training in the country uh, as a means of down selecting from the thousands of applicants we'll get down to you know maybe one to, to four uh, final selectees that we can then send to Axiom uh, and you know, do that final, okay, this is the person that interviews that kind of fits that personality characteristic they're looking for. Uh, I might do some medical testing as, as part of that pre-flight stage uh, and really has to be a person who is able to manage all of the research and development and the actual hands-on project management uh, of those industry products, okay? So that, that's the program. Um, and uh, yeah, selection will be based on merit. Uh, so any uh, race, uh, it, the only thing is it has to be an Australian citizen or permanent resident. Uh, yeah, I, I might move on that permanent resident or remove that, by the way, depending on the workshops and what people want to do. Uh, I might adjust this also, depending on whether the uh, Australian Space Agency wants to get involved at some point, they would be welcome to. I uh, will leave a door open there. Uh, but for now, uh, we're keeping it Australian citizens or permanent residents. Uh, and of course, the final training is by ax axiom. And, and we all want to be Jedis like our fathers. Guess what? Now's the chance. Okay. I don't care how old you are. I don't care your gender. I don't care uh, you know, your, your, your ethnicity, uh, your, your sexual orientation. None of that matters to me. What matters is your merit and your ability to do the job and your ability to get along with the rest of the team. Okay. So that, that's really it. Uh, remember the phrase coalition of the willing, uh, people who wanna get involved and, and support uh, and, and be a part of the program uh, that lays out everything. And it's, an, it's open to your questions now. What do you, what do you wanna know? Okay, so I've got one question initially. Thanks, Jason, it was excellent talk uh, as an intro. Uh, we'll do the Q and A now and um, with the information there, was the was the I know that you're going through looking like getting about twelve to twenty five projects. Would they be, they would actually be Australian only projects which this astronaut's going to be tending? Is that is that correct based on what you how you're describing it for the Soyuz sixty day? Yeah, yeah, strong preference to that. I wanted it to be Australian industry. The question is going to be is are there going to be enough Australian companies willing to give it a go, or are they going to be too shy? Because uh, my view is that a lot of Australian companies are a little bit shy and, and conservative. Uh, and this is a very avant-garde kind of a program. Uh, American companies have jumped on board for many years. I mean, the ISS has been around for 20 years now. And there have been plenty of American uh, and European products that have been made on the ISS. Um, but the ISS has been supported by a lot of programs uh, that that support flight opportunities, and they've had their own marketing in the country for many years to 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 do it. Uh, so we, um, yeah, we 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 might uh, it, we might open that up, but as long as the the, the flyer is Australian, I think that's the most important thing. Uh, but making it an Australian geared program means that the state governments are incentivized to be involved. 
you know, and they're saying, well, well, it's a little bit different or interesting. I mean, can you really make, make money? And it's like, well, the space industry is tripling over the next 10 years. Do you want the money or not? And, and usually then they, they're like, okay, let's see what you can do. Um, but it was the same kind of pushback we had with the space agency. You know, it, for many years, people said, you can't have a space, you can't do it in country. And now look, we've got all these programs and uh, it's very easy to kind of get past that pushback. So coalition of the willing, open first port of call preferences of strong companies coalition of the willing okay um Thank, thanks um uh, yeah actually i think partly scott's question is how reliant is save a business case on the iss what what program looked like post iss i think one thing that maybe wasn't quite clear is how axiom is going to use the iss exactly and then how do we use Ax axiom and spot in relationship with the iss so maybe you might need to cover that as well because I, not everybody understands how Axiom is going to work, I think, with the ISM. Yeah, it's a, it's a good, so Axiom won, I think, about $300 million, uh, to take over the commercial aspects of the ISS. And I probably said that, you know, it, it's Axiom's story to tell, not Sabre's. So it, I, I don't want to mess that story up on their behalf. Um, but you could, you could look at their press releases and, and learn a bit what, what they're doing there. Just to give you the, the, the straight and narrow of it is um, they're setting up a module on the ISS doing commercial flights. They're the only company with the commercial flights to the ISS. They're the only ones. They got it. Nobody else has it. Okay. Um, they are, uh, they, they got these modules that they're building that they're going to put in. The ISS is going to maintain its funding till 2030. That's what, eight years away. Mm. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to, do you orbit the ISS one module at a time? That's the, the current plan, as I understand it, one module at a time. And as they do orbit a module, Axiom adds a module. Okay. So uh, you know, eventually the ISS will be gone. And then the United States will have uh, you know, you know, Axiom, and Axiom will be the representative. Uh, and other nations might have other space stations. Uh, I imagine this service, since we only have a deal with Axiom at the moment, uh, Axiom will be the deal that we are working with. Mm, Does that answer the question for, for you, Scott? Are you good with that? Thumbs up from- You Dr. can't Scott. talk, Scott. I'm not, I'm not yeah, stopping uh, you. But... And, and Kush has the question, is there a minimum age for astronaut training? Uh, yeah, I, I, I gotta look that up with Axiom. I don't think there's an age limit one direction or another. Uh, I think common sense would be 18 or older. Uh, they might have a preference for 21 or older. Uh, I would say um, you know, there have been, uh, uh, on, the, on the higher end of the scale, there have been astronauts that have flown that are uh, you know, past 65 uh, before. Um, those were shorter stints. Uh, and uh, I would say that um, if a person is able to show the ability to manage the projects, has the technical understanding of how to manage those projects, uh, and has the ability to work with the team in a teamwork fashion, the maturity, emotional maturity is a big component of that with us, right? You gotta be a team player emotionally, not just someone who smiles in the camera and is likable, but somebody who has the emotional maturity to handle stress, uh, to handle, a workload does tasks on time. All of these things are important criteria. Um, so uh, a, a jack of all trades with strong technical skills. I, I, I think you, you'll, you'll find that that yeah, astronaut programs lead towards like mission specialists for a reason, uh, and that's the reason. Uh, but we're we're going to allow anybody to apply uh, with, with those ranges. So Jason, I also assume that the person that the Axiom selects doesn't necessarily be, have to be one of those companies specifically putting up a project. It would depend then on really on who is who is who puts their hand up and what they're, how they're qualified to manage it. It's not really. Well, we're we're going to do the pre-selection, okay. uh, and they're the final approval. It's their flight. Yes, so, yes. Oh, and and they're supporting us in this plan as well. So it's a two-way street because they, they they could have pulled a plug, right, and, and said no, no, it's got to be our way or the highway. But they're actually playing ball with us and, and being very good kind of uh, leaders. Uh, and and they like this idea because 
you know, they like the idea of democratization. It kind of fits where they want to go. Um, and uh, we're not the only nation, by the way, that's going this route, I think. I think other nations are, are looking at buying tickets. Uh, and, and if the Australian Space Agency finds a ticket, then yeah, I don't have to do all this work. <laughs> that's, that's right. Actually, given the fact that one of the venture capitalists comes from Israel, I suspect that they might be interested in doing it, wouldn't they? Sounds like um, that might be I, Look, it, it's, many nations are interested in doing it, right? Yeah. I'm focused on Australia, yeah. okay? Uh, and I'm not focused on nationality, except for the fact that they have to be Australian, right? Either citizen or, or permanent resident. I'm a permanent resident. Ooh, yeah. it could happen. You know, I, I could always at the end of the day say, you know what, Saber organized this whole thing. I'm going up. Do you want to do it? And they might say yes. And they might say, Jason, you feel a little weird. You play harmonica and Zoom calls. You know, no, nobody really likes that. Nobody likes that, right? There's we don't want to deal of, with you for six plenty years. of astronauts who don't play the instrument up on the space station, remember? I don't know. I don't know. It, but but that, that's the that's the point. You know, this is gonna be apolitical. Uh, this is completely open and transparent. Um, that's how we're rolling. Mm. Yeah, so um, in terms of the, how that's funding, it sounds like how it works is that there's money comes up through the actual projects field and that actually kind of helps pay for the, um, the seats, so to speak, indirectly through the, the way, because obviously Axiom also has to pay SpaceX who provides the launch vehicle that, they're at, that their staff go up on. So there's a bunch of people that have to, the money has to go down the chain, so to speak, to, to, to keep everything operational. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, that, that's the way it's going to work. The companies put the money because they want to build a product that has an advantage. That's what closes the loop. That's the secret yep. sauce, right? Without that, the company's got to spend 10 times, 20 times the amount of money to get on orbit. So that's the business case. Uh, 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 Nate asks a really good question. What are the yes. plans for continuation of the program? Rotate crews and projects every 60 days. Mm -hmm. uh, at this stage, we're talking about a ticket every two years, I think that's the pace, okay? Which means we have to be able to develop the products on orbit. Um, and it's a good question that I think is gonna come up in the workshops that we need to figure out. Because uh, what if you succeed at setting up manufacturing for a product and you wanna get volume of that product and continuous delivery mm. on orbit? We gotta figure that out. Uh, and it might be that the astronaut's job is to is to qualify that as possible. Like build, you, know, you build a machine on Earth, you put it in space, you start churning out your product in space. Uh, maybe it doesn't work the first time. You got two years to, to develop, or, or maybe it's an annual thing. It's volume dependent because I got to pay for that, sick, that seat every time. So intuitively, I would think that companies are not going to want to spend $5 million a year. Uh, pharmaceuticals has proven me wrong already by the way, uh, and they do much more than 5 million every year, much, much more. They're, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on, 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 uh, on orbit manufacturing for pharmaceuticals. Um, and they're not telling us what they're doing. It's so exciting. But, uh, it, you know, it, it, there's a discovery process. It might be every two years when we start, there might be companies that want to move more aggressively. I'm leaving that completely open. It's going to be dependent on volume. Yeah, I actually think that the mining companies might also be interested, but I, I sometimes it's to do with asteroid mining and things like that. But they might have a may not really need a manned uh, way of doing it. They might want to use robots. So yeah, it's not the, not the same it. animal, Wayne. Not at all the same animal. This is this is yeah. human beings that need to make stuff. Yeah, this is quite different. It was basically you need to be inside and you get a man tend like what they're currently doing at the moment. So I think that that, that you have a point in that. Also, in the case of what uh, Axiom's doing, they're probably going to have paying customers from other countries. So if you look at what your proposal is to get a certain number of projects just looked after by one particular person just representing Australia, that's probably the idea every couple of years probably does make sense in terms of how, it, how the workload can be managed and also how Axiom wants to engage us because they've got other people paying. Well, so, that's, a, that's a good point. There's a limited number of seats. Yep, that's right. In fact, looking so, at it, there's probably only four people left. Our, our business time. development manager pushes, pokes me in the eye every every month. She, she's like, "What have we done this month to make this happen?" Mm -hmm. uh, and and there's a sense of urgency um, because 
the number of seats it's a limited resource so you really do got to get in there to get a seat now right now 2022 is full 2023 is full but they can move someone if we find someone sooner than later right I, i'm banking on 2024 just because i know how long it takes australians to move uh lead time issue country. and i think that that's probably realistic so uh, what but we... i could be wrong though folks yeah. i could be wrong I, I hope i hope people really get into this um uh, commercial Lou, Lou asked a good question commercial companies from other countries or any of this kind of access to the iss yeah yes and no other other countries are uh looking at buying tickets for themselves uh and they'll make a national program out of that uh that's my understanding at least uh i don't know any other country which is doing this as a public private partnership like saber is not um, like this business no. i mean what what they do have is is uh, projects that go to the iss and they're they're actually managed by members or representative astronauts of the of all the partners okay so that means you might get somebody from from europe going up there to to do mission to experiments on behalf of somebody else in ESA, but that's actually a, they're an official partner this isn't the same thing as a private astronaut going up doing research totally different um situation completely which is what you're getting through axiom which hasn't ever happened before really so this is the future really yeah uh, okay uh next question Um, what we'd like, though, just my, from my perspective of the NSSA, is trying to get some way that we can help advertise it for you. So what would you think that we can do to help that? Uh, we can obviously put out some publicity materials that you've got. Um, we're going to be putting this talk up for people, other people to see, and I'll try and advertise it. So what did you think that we, we can do in terms of helping you advertise it? I, I, I had no expectations coming to this call, but I, I, th I think if you want to be evangelists for this, I'm more than welcome, more than welcome NSSA as evangelists. Uh, I, I think if you know people in industry that, that might not be aware of it and might not understand the benefit uh, that you could get from uh, manufacturing in space, bring them along. We'll certainly uh, be advertising the workshops uh, and uh, more than welcome, like I said, Coalition of the Willing uh, if, if you want to do promotion of this, more than happy, more than happy to do that. So we just need to make sure we can link to the press releases, in other words, from our website onto yours. Yeah, to yeah, help anything that comes absolutely. on. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'll never hold you back from, from reposting a Sabre. Save, save uh, that's all right. So what, what we'll do is um, anything that comes by, we'll just, just let us know and we'll try and push it on to other people. But I've got a, a few people on my mailing list. Yeah, sure. Uh, Nate has another question. Uh, yep. Post ISS, how does Saber contribute to maintaining the Axiom modules on orbit? Um, uh, we're not their operators formally. Uh, I would love to do that job. You know, so we we let them know, hey, we want to be your Huckleberry, yeah, uh, managing the the the, the station. Um, I think there's a few years before they need to build that out, but because uh, the ISS is going to be around for at least eight, so. Um, yeah, at this point, all we're really focusing is on the astronaut program. We're not, we're, we're not booked to do their ops for them. But I will say that the fact that we're running the Mission Control Center at the Space Agency uh, was one of the reasons why they thought we were a good partner to hang out with. We'll say that. You've got the right technologies they, they would possibly want to use as well. So that's the main thing for it. Thank sure, you. sure. All right, so we have any more questions? Don't be shy. I think the main thing to note then is that you said you'll be conducting some workshops. So um, when we get that information, send it to us and we'll, we'll retweet it. Because I know it sounded like you were just in the process of doing it. So as soon as we get all that extra information, we can work out. I think we've got about half, half the people on this call at the moment of, of business as well so we'll um we'll see what they they make with it to, to try and help uh, turn up so that's probably the best suggestion i can make and i'd like to thank you very much on behalf of everybody attending of a very interesting talk thanks thank everybody you. uh wish you the best keep on innovating uh and uh looking forward to seeing you at the workshops take yeah. care